Our guest speaker today is Roy Vu, son of a Vietnamese refugee's parents. Roy Vu was raised, born and raised in Houston. He earned his PhD in 2006 in history at the University of Houston. He is currently a history professor at the Dallas College North Lake Campus in Irving. Professor Vu's selected publications include co-editing Feasted Landscapes, Sustainability in American Topics, Kendall Hunt, second edition in 2018, I, Our Finite Bounty, and Anthology of Sustainability Topics, Kendall Hunt, 2017, and Natives of a Ghost Country, the Vietnamese in Houston and their construction of a post-war community in Asian Americans in Dixie, Race and the Migration in the South, ed edited by Kai Tai, Y. Josie, and Jigna Desai, University of Illinois Press, 2013. Professor Vu is currently writing a book titled Form to Freedom, Vietnamese Americans and Their Home Gardens. The manuscript is under contract for publication with Texas A&M University Press 2021. Now we have Professor Vu. Um, so uh, thank you everyone uh, for being here. Good morning and thank you Nakia uh, for uh, moderating uh, this session. Uh, I appreciate all the assistance and, and Tim, thank you for all the tech support. Uh, so I appreciate all that. Hope everyone's doing well. And can you hear me clearly, Nakia? Yes. I just want to make sure. Clearly, yes. Okay, great. Thank you. Let me increase the volume just a little more. All right. Um, in regards to my presentation for today, the title of my presentation is New Roots in the Texas Soil, Congolese Refugees, Planet Ford Farms, and Sustainable Urban Farming. Uh, now, uh, let me go ahead and um, share you my PowerPoint presentation. Uh, let's see. Should I go ahead and, oh, may I go ahead and share my content? Oh, thank you. Appreciate it. So let me go ahead and show you uh, my presentation. And I'll go ahead and go to the presentation screen. So my gateway interest uh, to this particular topic stems from a couple of reasons. One, my parents um, left Vietnam in 1975 as refugees, as uh, Nikia mentioned. Uh, I'm a child of refugee parents. And my parents uh, eventually resettled in Houston, Texas. And the second uh, reason uh, why I became uh, invested in this topic is, um, as Nikia mentioned earlier, I'm currently writing a book about Vietnamese refugees and their home gardens. So upon conducting my research in Houston, I stumbled upon the Planet Ford Farms nonprofit organization uh, through a mutual acquaintance, uh, food journalist and freelance writer, uh, David Lefwich, who introduced me to Liz Vallette, who is currently the president of Plan Planet Forward Farms. So I became drawn to their remarkable work with Congolese refugees, uh, particularly refugees who had a farming background, living and laboring in Houston. My original field of study was on the Vietnam War and uh, US diplomatic history, but over the years, my research interests have shifted over to Asian American studies and critical refugee studies and now critical food studies. I'm clearly no expert on African history uh, or the Congolese diaspora or even agricultural history. And in fact, I know I have colleagues who know more about the topics of Congolese histories and West African cuisine and um, farming in general. Uh, I'm not a farmer. I'm not even a gardener. OK, so I have a brown thumb. But my parents uh, are definitely gardeners, uh, and they do um, I love gardening. And a lot of Vietnamese refugees uh, have a, a farming background as well. Uh, but my interest lies in the whys and, and what's behind issues such as food labor, production, and consumption, particularly uh, by marginalized and racialized communities. Uh, I'm interested in making the invisible become more visible to the general public. After all, history never ends until every story is told. I always tell my students that. So let us hear a little bit about Congolese refugee farmers and planted Ford farms. I apologize in advance, should I mispronounce any names, any errors here are of my own doing, okay? All right, so let me go ahead and go to the next slide. So here's a rundown of what I'll be presenting today. I'll provide a brief introduction of Congolese refugees. I'll talk briefly about Planet Ford Farms, and then I'll move on to the sustainable urban farming practices. And then I'll share three stories uh, of um, Congolese refugees in Houston. 
and then I'll talk a little bit more about emancipatory food waste uh, and this concept of farm to freedom. And you have three major tenets of emancipatory food waste, food sovereignty, culinary citizenship, and homeland duality. And finally, I'll conclude the presentation and provide some uh, further uh, materials uh, in case you wish to read more about diaspora communities and uh, their food waste. And finally, I do want to give a shout out to Plant Four Farms and, and also in Dallas, uh, Bonton Farms, and how, um, if you wish, um, could support urban farmers in Houston as well as in Dallas. All right, so introduction of Congolese refugees. In recent decades, hundreds of thousands of Congolese refugees from the Democratic Republic of the Congo, sometimes referred to as Congo Kinshasa, so right over here. Okay. <clears throat> and refugees from the Republic of Congo, otherwise known as uh, Congo Brazzaville, right over here. Okay. Uh, and in the map of uh, the continent of Africa, you can see the Democratic Republic of Congo, the yellow star here, formerly Zaire. And then you have uh, the Republic of Congo, uh, this uh, green country here with the red star. Uh, so they're neighboring countries. So for Congolese refugees in those uh, two respective Congos, uh, they have experienced traumas uh, and difficulties of war, displacement, refugee camp life, resettlement, uh, and uh, marginalization. For the more fortunate, some Congolese refugees were eventually granted asylum to resettle in Houston, Texas. Uh, now, uh, in regards to uh, the brief resettlement history in, in Houston, uh, they will work tirelessly to earn a decent living wage while residing in working class neighborhoods of Southwest Houston as they adjust to living in America. Nevertheless, despite the overwhelming challenges and odds, the Congolese diaspora in Houston continue to persevere and demonstrate resilience and agency as they develop their own community and retain their food heritage. Some have even turned to urban farming and home gardening constructing their own homeland duality via Congolese food waste. Planted Forward Farms, a nonprofit organization in Houston, assists Congolese refugee farmers establish not only sustainable small-scale urban farms that sell fresh and locally grown produce, but the organization also provides farmers the opportunity to earn a modest living. Today, uh, as I mentioned earlier, I will briefly share three stories from the Congolese diaspora in Houston. Their personal stories are just a few, uh, significant examples out of thousands that will allow us to critically contextualize and historicize refugees, as well as immigrants in the United States, who attempt to cultivate sustainable, small-scale urban farms toward achieving the three tenets of emancipatory food waste, food sovereignty, culinary citizenship, and homeland duality. All right. So just uh, quickly, uh, a few um, facts about um, Congress, Congress diaspora in Houston um, and how it fits uh, with the resilience track. So for the Congress refugees, there are making um, attempts to uh, not only adapt to their new livelihoods here in Houston or here in Texas, um, uh, and again, folks in Houston, Texas, but also uh, some would even thrive um, after surviving uh, their uh, crises uh, that they had to endure, and these crises would include dealing with uh, the traumas of war, refuge, resettlement, and uh, racialization. Uh, and they would uh, resettle in Houston as well as throughout the United States. Uh, now, I don't have exact population figures on the Congolese diaspora in Houston. What I do know is, uh, according to um, a Rice University study, uh, Rice University in Houston, the African immigrant population in Houston uh, numbers approximately 60,000 today. And the Nigerian community has the largest diaspora with roughly 23,500 Nigerians. No other group uh, would have more than 5,000. Uh, the Ghanaian population, will be the second largest uh, of the African immigrant population in Houston. And for the Congolese population, it's definitely less than 5,000. And I apologize, I don't have the exact figures. Uh, so it's just a small community, but it's a growing community. It's a community that is, again, thriving uh, thanks to organizations like Planet Ford and thanks to their resilience, okay? All right, so moving on to Planet Forward Farms. Um, so let's talk a little bit about Planet Forward Farms and then I'll share you three personal stories. Uh, so, historian Liz Vallette is the president of Planet Forward, as I mentioned earlier. She is a West Point graduate and Iraqi war veteran. Uh, Liz assesses Planet Forward's collaboration with local refugees. And during my interview with her um, before uh, the pandemic, uh, she um, 
I mentioned some of the positive gains, but also discuss some of the challenges as well. Uh, for instance, uh, quote, um, it takes a while to get a farm up and running. And to many of the farmers, when they first start with us, they're still learning English and they're still learning to navigate the culture here. So there's definitely an uphill struggle. It does require a lot of work. As a growing organization, we're still going through some growing pains and trying to make sure that we are able to support the training and enterprise programs fully. But ultimately, I do find the farmers seem at peace. They seem at joy, uh, they seem to enjoy, excuse me, very much enjoy what they do for a living. They take a lot of pride in the farms and what they grow and what they produce. So I think in that sense, they're content. It is challenging, there are challenges. Sometimes it takes a little while to get your income up uh, to uh, a modest living. Uh, we did have one farmer who just bought a house. And so there is, after three or four years of farming and saving money, we think that the farmers can get to a place of being able to chuck away a little bit of money and actually gain a little piece of the American dream, kind of quote. Regarding the successes for the farmers and uh, what Liz is most proud of, uh, she asserts, quote, I was trying to think of mostly individual successes for the farmers. I guess that's sort of a success when you see the farmers being able to buy a home or you're hearing that their kids are graduating at the top of their class from high school and heading on to go to college. So sort of the second and third order effects of what the farmers are achieving through this income they're able to get. I think one of the most rewarding things to see for me is how confident they are in their abilities. So there's a lot of self-confidence that I think is nice to see, particularly for folks having to start over and maybe several steps down the rung of the ladder than they were back at home, end of quote. Okay, so uh, in regards to Planet Four Farms, uh, here's a brief history from their website. Uh, and so as you can see here, you have, uh, let's see, that way, sorry. Uh, in regards to their uh, brief history, um, Planet Four was founded in 2011. Uh, by a family of philanthropic entrepreneurs, the O'Donnells, wanted to enable the similar entrepreneurial ambitions of refugees being resettled in Houston. Refugees with agricultural backgrounds are resettled here with few options for finding meaningful, dignified work that utilizes their crucial skill sets. In collaboration with Catholic Charities, local refugee resettlement office, and Urban Harvest, the family worked with a group of skilled Congolese refugees to deliberately craft an urban market farming project. By 2012, the first round of Planet Forward urban farming training began, lasting one year. By 2015, there were nine farmers, each earning a living by managing their own farming enterprise on approximately one half acre each. In 2016, we were honored to be featured on Anthony Bourdain's show, Parts Unknown Houston. Um, I do have a video clip, uh, which I'll share, you the, share with you in the, in the uh, chat room um, so that uh, you can have access to the video on YouTube. And there's a second clip that I would like to show as well, but Unfortunately, um, there will be some uh, technical issues with WebEx, so I apologize for that. So I'll also post a second video clip uh, in the chat, so that way you can have access to the video link. So today, um, Planet Ford have 13 farmers operating at eight farms uh, within the Planet Ford network, and two additional Planet Ford alumni farmers own an independent farming partnership. We are actively working to increase farming opportunities for new Americans in the coming years. So that's their brief history from their website. I advise you to check it out if you wish to know more about Planet Ford and if you would, particularly if you wish uh, to uh, support Planet Ford um, either through volunteering your time or donating uh, or purchasing uh, some of their uh, produce and merchandise. Okay, all right, so let's move on. Let's see, all right. So a few basic facts. Uh, Planet Four Farms are averaging approximately 60,000 per acre this year, 2020. Uh, it took three to five years before Planet Four Farmers uh, are earning uh, our benchmark gross income of $30,000 per farm. Planet Four uh, invested $10,000 plus staffing up front into each 2018 farm. It provides $10,000 plus per year in support to each of the eight farms. Farmers themselves prefer to collaborate with one another, share equipment and technical expertise, and grow into larger farms. Here's a map of the city of Houston or the southwest portion of the city of Houston. And uh, the green circles uh, with uh, an X inside represent the four separate sites where you have uh, a total of six acres and eight farms, and you have 13 farmers uh, working and farming on those eight farms. The blue star is uh, their warehouse where they would wash and pack and uh, freeze uh, the produce of necessary 
back and make sure that the produce is uh, produced uh, clean and fresh uh, for um, their uh, farm shares. And then uh, you have, uh, so as the red circle with the X, uh, that is the uh, office of uh, Planet Four Farms. So as you can see, uh, they're located in Southwest Houston near the Bel Air area uh, in uh, working class uh, neighborhoods. Um, and you have uh, regards to um, their farms. This, uh, these are a couple of photos I took from Westbury Community Farm site again, Southwest Houston. Beautiful farms, uh, just lush and um, very green and um, very productive farms as well. Now, of course, uh, there were numerous challenges. For instance, Hurricane Harvey in 2017, right, causing flooding issues and destroying some of their crops. So. Uh, it can be very heartbreaking, but again, for these Congolese refugees, they're, they're tough, they're courageous, they're resilient, uh, and uh, they're hard workers who are willing to um, try to make a modest living here um, in the United States. And also, in addition, um, they are retaining um, part of their food culture uh, and reclaiming part of food culture. So there are also, in other words, um, seeking and gaining emancipatory food ways, which I delve, uh, I would delve more um, into deep, delve more deeply into later on. Right, so here's another photo of uh, their Westbury uh, site. So again, nice, beautiful farm on a sunny day. Uh, one of the uh, plant for farmers. Okay, and um, as regards to again the um, the Congolese uh, refugee farmers. Uh, you have uh, men and women, you have um, family members and who would uh, help um, uh, farm um, the land and uh, make try to make a living uh, together. And so you do have, uh, in other words, um, family labor and, 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 um, and it's quite common among refugee families to see um, both spouses and also their adult children um, Working to work together, right, uh, to uh, make a, a decent living and survive and adjust and thrive. Okay, all right. So, moving on to uh, sustainable um, urban urban farming practices. Uh, so, we look at some of these sustainable practices of small scale urban farming with Planet Four Farms. Here, you have just uh, a select uh, uh, number of uh, practices um, assisting refugees with training provide resources and support for the Congolese refugee farmers, creating sustainable small-scale urban farms um, in Southwest Houston, providing fresh, organic, and accessible produce at farmers markets and also via weekly farm shares, providing refugees an opportunity to maintain culturally, uh, cultural sustainability. Uh, in regards to cultural sustainability, this part of societal sustainability, again, goes back to Congolese refugees having the ability to have some control over their own food production and consumption and cultivate uh, crops that are familiar to them back home uh, in the two Congos, Congo Brazzaville and Congo Kinshasa. In addition, um, be able to make Congolese meals and dishes that are familiar to and introduce such Congolese, not only such Congolese produce, but also Congolese dishes uh, to Estonians, right? And so they are expanding, right, uh, their food ways. All right, uh, for what's uh, going down the list here, provide refugees an opportunity to make a modest income, give refugees an opportunity to maintain cultural stability, as I mentioned earlier, sorry, I'm repeating that. Uh, avert food insecurity in neighborhoods with lack of healthy food options, particularly in Southwest Houston, particularly um, um, on the Westbury site, you have uh, surrounding uh, apartment buildings, um, working class neighborhoods uh, that uh, may not have uh, access right to healthy food options uh, or lack access to healthy food options uh, and so this would help uh, uh, avert uh, some food insecurity uh, and of course beautifying green to urban areas these farms are beautiful they're lush they're green uh, much more uh, of course uh, uh, pleasing uh, to see than than say just you know some urban wasteland where you have you know tons of billboards particularly Houston is no choice for billboards having too many billboards so this is a more pleasant view, right? Uh, and of course, enhancing Houston's cultural colonial diversity, as I mentioned earlier, with cultural sustainability for Congolese refugees. All right, so um, now let's uh, 
go ahead and talk about uh, individual refugee stories of resilience. And I apologize if I mispronounce their names. Uh, starting with the story of uh, Constant uh, Angula, born in Republic of Congo, again, Congo, Brazzaville. As you can see, his family fled from home, uh, from uh, his home country in February 1999, and resettled in Gabon as refugees, and arrived in Houston in March 2009. So uh, let me provide some uh, details of uh, uh, Constant's story. Uh, one of uh, Plant Ford, uh, uh, one of Plant Ford's successful farmers, particularly with the local farmers market audience, is Constant uh, Angula, a refugee from the Republic of Congo, Congo Brazzaville. In February 1999, uh, Constant and his wife uh, and their children fled from the civil war that has ravaged their native country. They made refuge to the neighboring country of Gabon and resettled in Chibanga, the nation's capital, okay, capital Gabon. They made refuge to the neighboring country of Gabon um, and resettled in Chibanga. Uh, after making it safely to Chibanga, Constant just decided to return to farming and start making a living once more. The decision to return to some level of normalcy. He reflects his 10 years as a refugee farmer in Gabon. Quote, at Gabon, when I get to Chibanga, where I was living, I saw nobody was planting vegetables. Then I start to plant vegetables and make my life over there. I love it. Because when I had my own farm in Chibanga, there was around four hectares. And in very dry season, I was taking maybe 12 up to 15 citizens to work with me. In the rainy season, maybe three or four people to work with me. Uh, and of course, so another thing about, um, another interesting fact about uh, a lot of these uh, Congress refugee uh, farmers, they come from a farming background uh, in their respective home countries and while in refuge, right? Um, we sending in a refugee camp, a UNHCR refugee camp, uh, they would, uh, make attempts to cultivate um, crops um, on refugee camps, um, uh, despite the dire conditions, despite the subpar uh, refugee camp conditions, uh, they would uh, try to continue on with the farming traditions in these refugee camps. And you see this with uh, Vietnamese uh, refugees as well back in the 1970s, 1980s, uh, refugee camps um, in the Philippines, uh, Malaysia, uh, Thailand, and so on uh, during the late 1970s and into 1980s. So this is not uncommon, right, for refugees. Again, um, for refugees, in this case, colleagues refugees, they're showing a great deal of resourcefulness, courage, and resilience. Okay. All right, so going back to Constant. Um, meanwhile, Constant and his family continue to work with uh, United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees, UNHCR officials, U.S. Embassy, and other foreign embassies in hopes of resigning to another nation. After 10 years of farming in Gabon, uh, Constant and his family received approval through a U.S. refugee program to resettle the United States. Uh, on March 14, 2009, they left Chibanga, Gabon, and headed to America, arriving in Houston, Texas the very next day. Constant recalls their first few months adjusting to live in Houston. Quote, when I get here, it was not easy to start. It was very hard. I didn't know that if I had some friends here. So it's not easy. When I get here, maybe two months, I didn't find any Congolese. But in the same apartment we were living in southwest Houston, there was there were many Congolese from my country. I didn't know that, and he laughed uh, at the end of this uh, statement. So Kostad, uh recalls it starts uh, with uh, urban Houston and Planet Ford. Well, maybe one year after arriving in Houston, I see there was a Westbury farm. I go to ask them uh, that I need to farm. Again, it comes from a farming background. They sent me to Urban Harvest. When I go to Urban Harvest uh, around April 2011, I was working with them. Almost a year later, they started Planet Ford. They told me about that. I come to Planet Ford and started my training. After maybe two months, they would take me and uh, took me to work with them. At the time, I was taking my training. I was like a farm manager after maybe one more year. After that, it's my small land to start farming by myself, end of quote. So Nguala uh, states that uh, there are many benefits to working with Planet Ford, particularly when it comes to handling, completing the piles of paperwork that are required for non-native English uh, as a third language speaker uh, or sometimes a fourth language speaker because a lot of Congolese speak two or three other languages. Okay. Uh, to labor on an urban farm in Houston, on cultivating the types of crops in Houston, uh, he provides uh, some examples. Well, I plant off. Here I plant when I go to market. Somebody uh, come to ask me a vegetable I never plant, ask, what is this? Give me the benefit of the doubt. I'll see what I can uh, get with seeds. So some people bring the seeds. I plant off everything, everything that I see, like roselle. Uh, now, many people want you to bring Roselle when finished, and many farmers 
now start to plant it and sell it to market as well. In my country, if you don't have Roselle, it's no life. End of quote. Uh, Nguala uh, also raises, uh, um, Mr. Nguala also raises many other vegetables, herbs, and fruits, both familiar and unfamiliar to him. So a lot of these colleagues refugees would, would also grow uh, produce uh, that are um, more familiar uh, to um, historians, um, and particularly in regards to um, southern food waste, right? So you have crops like, um, um, you know, for instance, like okra, for example, that uh, also known as common in, in uh, West Africa, but also common uh, throughout the U.S. South uh, and in Texas. Okay, so they will also grow uh, other crops uh, as well. And uh, for uh, Constant, um, he would uh, cultivate uh, amaranth as well and spinach and okra, eggplant, African eggplant, sorrel, uh, cassava, water spinach, uh, arugula, fennel, cilantro, uh, dill, rosemary, and so on. His favorite is arugula, uh, so he likes arugula a lot. All right, so uh, let's move on to, sorry, Toto uh, Alamasi. Uh, his friends come Alamasi, and of course, photo was taken before uh, the pandemic, uh, and um, I had much shorter hair back then, and less white hair. Uh, so uh, another refugee farmer who raised uh, and cultivated a urban farm with uh, Planet Ford, uh, is uh, Toto uh, Alamasi. Again, he goes by Alamasi, so I refer to him as Alamasi. Uh, he was born and raised in um, uh, Uvera, uh, Democratic Republic of the Congo, or Congo Kinshasa, in 1960. Growing up, he had learned farming from his mother, while his father operated a restaurant business in Uvera. Uh, Alamasi recalls, quote, my mother was a farmer all her life. From my mom, we mainly learned how to grow and how to prepare an area to do something. It was not for business, but only for eating for the family. He goes on to describe his family's farm. Um, it was a big farm. Uh, I'm sorry, quote, it was a big farm. We planted corn, cassava, sweet potatoes, uh, black peas, peanuts, uh, African eggplant, and so on, end of quote. Unfortunately, uh, Alamasi's father passed away when he was young. At the age of 21, Alamasi uh, married uh, Fatuma and became a teacher. He, became, uh, he also became a pastor and a women's rights activist. At home, he cultivated a garden of crops for his family, not for business. As an outspoken pastor, it was uh, his advocacy for women's rights, as well as coming to defense of one of his fellow villagers over property uh, that his life was threatened by local authorities. In fact, uh, Alamasi's secretary was shot and killed. Alamasi himself was arrested, spending two nights in jail. After his release, he gathered his family uh, in um, preparation to leave their home country and contacted UNHCR officials to seek political asylum in uh, Uganda. In 2008, Alamas, Pastor Alamasi, uh, his wife Fatuma, and their children, uh, and also um, some nieces and nephews, 17 people all together, fled from the home country and trekked to South Uganda, where they eventually arrived at the uh, Nakivel refugee camp managed by UNHCR officials. At Nakivel, they spent nearly four years at the Uganda refugee camp, but after receiving some necessary monthly provisions of beans and cooking oil, UNHCR officials gave him some land for an extended family of 17 members, where Alamasi amazingly managed to cultivate a farm and plant some crops, such as corn, cassava, and sweet potatoes, growing more than enough food um, for, for everyone um, in, in his extended family. Unfortunately, Alamasi's health began to deteriorate at uh, the refugee camp. Uh, again, a lot of these refugee camps, unfortunately, they're uh, underfunded or not well-funded enough, and so they have subpar living conditions. Uh, after three years and nine months at Nakivel, his case was finally approved for re refugee resettlement by UNHCR officials. Alamasi and his family began their journey to the United States, arriving in Houston on September 20th, 2011. He knew nothing about Houston, quote, uh, what means Houston? I didn't know. When we came here, the weather here is like the weather in my country, and I like it. And of course, you know, Houston's sweltering, hot, and humid, uh, particularly during the summer months. Uh, after working a few odd minimum wage jobs, such as uh, a night, guards, uh, night security a guard, uh, Alamasi came in contact with Planet Ford in 2014, and thanks to his contact person with Houston's Associated Catholic Charities. Uh, and so, after months of training with Planet Ford uh, personnel in the farming and entrepreneurial programs, he began working on his urban farm at the Westbury Community Garden. There, he would cultivate crops according to the seasons, bok choy, collard greens, cauliflower, and okra. Alamasi also uh, raises herbs and vegetables and fruits like uh, amaranth, African eggplant, sweet potatoes, and sugar cane that reminded him of his homeland. Um, Alamasi asserts, uh, quote, uh, when we 
uh, this, this is in regard to uh, the produce I just mentioned. Uh, Alamasi uh, asserts, when we eat this, we feel like home, end of quote. At a small farm, uh, he walks the guys between his banana trees. Very proud of his banana trees, as you can see in this photo, um, but with one of the banana trees uh, behind us. He points out the several bunches of small bananas, with each bunch carrying a dozen or more. He proudly and joyfully declares, quote, I grow these banana trees here. When we eat bananas, we remember Africa, end of quote. Okay, so this is photos of um, Alamasi family farm uh, uh, in Westbury. Okay, uh, some fig trees on the left and some, uh, some African eggplants on the right. All right, moving on to the third and final story, uh, story of uh, Adaranya Pierre uh, Aruchi Nagiza. Um, he goes by Pierre. Uh, so Pierre uh, is a little West African refugee farmer currently co collaborating with uh, Planet Ford, uh, born in Kutu, Democratic Republic of the Congo, uh, again, Congo, Kinshasa. Uh, Pierre's parents cultivated over 200 acres of farmland in a two-acre garden. His parents also practiced animal husbandry, raising goats and rabbits. Pierre recalls his farming years back home, describing the rainy season and listening to vegetables, herbs, and fruit trees grown. Yams, beans, cassava, peanuts, sweet potatoes, uh, maize, cloves, and so on. Both of Maturayas, or both Pierre's parents, uh, passed away uh, years before he was forced to flee from his home country. In October 2010, due to the seemingly never-ending and deadly civil war, Pierre and his wife and their children made the decision to leave their home village of Kutu and travel three days by bus to Kenya, arriving at a UNHCR refugee camp. There, living alongside thousands of African refugees, Pierre and his family remained in the camp for approximately two years, during which he fell severely ill due to stress, uh, spoiled food, and poor camp conditions. Eventually, with help from a friend, Pierre and his family were transferred to Nairobi, Kenya's capital. Uh, they were transferred there in May 2012. They stayed in Nairobi for four and a half years, where his health improved. He was able to find a steady job, and his children returned to school. Yet, their status remained as refugees, as they adjusted to life in a big city. Meanwhile, Pierre regularly made appointments to meet and interview with UNHCR officials in hopes of securing refugee resettlement approval for him and his family. Finally, in November 2016, his perseverance paid off and again, approval for refugee resettlement in the United States. He and his family were to be settled in Houston uh, by January 2017, and were to be assisted uh, with housing and, basic necessities, housing and basic necessities by the Alliance for Multicultural Community Service, or known locally as the Alliance, a refugee resettlement nonprofit organization in Houston. That summer, Pierre discovered about Planted Ford through another Congolese refugee. So you have a lot of uh, Congolese refugees networking together, and also like to work together on their farms. Um, and uh, he learned about Planet Ford through Alamasi. He and his wife, uh, Emily, applied for Planet Ford's training program to be a self-sufficient urban farmer. They started training in August 2017, completed the training program in June 2018, where they were rewarded with a plot of land to farm in the Westbury Community Garden in Southwest Houston. Uh, Pierre recalls how, to, uh, how he became an urban farmer with Planet Ford. Quote, I was very interested, and they make an application for me and my wife. So from August 2017 to June 2018, we were trained here. Uh, I was working at Papa's restaurant at the time while being trained with, uh, uh, while taking training classes with Planet Forward. I can say I was blessed to be chosen among our 17 trained people. Me and my wife, we, we uh, worked here to be to get to this place. This farm was uh, originally for the demonstration of Planet Forward, but they decided to give us this place, end of quote. So Pierre and his wife continue to work hard and persevere just like their fellow Congolese refugee farmers. Okay. Uh, unfortunately, uh, for these uh, video clips, the two video clips I uh, I hope to uh, provide, again, we have some technical issues, uh, but I will provide the links uh, in the chat, uh, so in the chat section, so that way you could uh, have access to those links. Um, I don't think these videos will work. Uh, so let's uh, move on to uh, emancipatory food waste. Oops, I don't know why it does that. Okay, so moving on to farm to freedom, uh, emancipatory food waste, going back to those three tenets of emancipatory food waste. Uh, starting with food sovereignty. Food sovereignty is about having control over some healthy food sources. Okay, uh, If space and resources are available, no matter how limited, refugees typically cultivate produce to gain access to fresh and affordable food, which leads to better overall diet, health, and food security. Immigrants and refugees typically cultivate crops familiar to their daily food consumption from their home country, preserving their food heritage. By preserving their food heritage, they demonstrate food resistance to unhealthy food options that are often ubiquitous in refugee immigrant working class neighborhoods. 
to overcome marginalization of their food heritage, they will be agents of food justice, active agents of food justice, using herbs, fruits, and vegetables from their own farms and gardens to make culinary dishes that remind them of home. So this uh, ties in with food sovereignty. Okay, again, one of the uh, main tenets of a master of food waste. The second one, culinary citizenship, is where refugees as well as immigrants would establish roots and sense of belonging, in this case, Congolese homeland, by cultivating their produce and preserving food heritage. They will also establish roots and a sense of belonging here in the United States via farming foods. In other words, it allows them to grow their American roots. Uh, so through farming and gardening, by cultivating crops that they're familiar with and familiar to Estonians, they are being rooted here in the United States as well. And we'll grow fruit trees, herbs, and vegetables uh, to make prepared uh, Congolese culinary dishes, both traditional ones and new ones. Uh, not legal citizenship per se, but they do have a strong sense of belonging. Uh, and so they do have ties to two homelands, over in two Congos and here in the United States, where they would cultivate uh, land uh, literally here in the United States and, and Texas, and figuratively, of course, um, by remembering their Congolese uh, homelands to cultivate these Congolese crops. Uh, establish, uh, they would also establish the right to belong to the land, right? Uh, they would belong to the land, I'm sorry, they would establish the right to belong to the land here through years of intense labor and sustainable urban farming. It's culinary citizenship. And finally, homeland duality will maintain the Congolese food heritage and roots via farming. Uh, and they would also establish their American roots uh, through farming and as well as gardening. A sense of belonging to two homelands. It would also avert a double dislocation. So not only dislocation from our homeland, but also combat, uh, combating uh, dislocation here in the United States as a marginalized population. And so they would avert a double dislocation via emancipatory food waves. And it would diversify Houston's culinary and cultural landscapes. And finally, Congolese refugee farmers will continue to build and transform America by providing food options to urban Americans, more specifically here, urban historians. Finally, in conclusion, since I'm sorry, I'm going too fast, I'm running a little bit out of time here. <clears throat> Marginalized populations have often responded robustly to their citizenless status and subpar trade conditions by cultivating small farms and gardens. These ostracized populations purposely transform negative spaces carve out small but not insignificant green places for themselves, resourcefully transform urban landscapes, challenging their marginalization from others, surviving their poor conditions by any advanced ways of seeking freedom and finding it. And this ties in with the three uh, main tenets of sustainability, environmental sustainability, where Congolese refugees would cultivate sustainable small-scale urban farms in Houston and provide uh, fresh organic produce to urban dwellers via weekly farm shares at farmers markets, Economic sustainability in return to make a modest living through farming and uh, that would help combat the city's challenges with food security issues. And societal, cultural sustainability diversifies Houston's culinary scene with Congolese food and cuisine and contribute to the city's rich cultural heritage and demonstrate the daily contributions of refugees uh, and immigrants as well here in the United States. Okay. So henceforth for the Congolese diaspora, farming offers a group uh, a growing sense of freedom, freedom from a civil war, Imprisonment, tyranny, difficult refugee camp conditions, and rootlessness. The small farms and marshes grow silently until they bloom into full view of our, con uh, of our consciousness. For the Congolese diaspora, they have suffered, survived, and succeeded in unearthing their very own existence, planting their future and freedom for current and future generations to remember, record, consume, share, and rejoice. Then perhaps in the constructed and mass food ways of gaining food sovereignty, uh, food sovereignty, culinary citizenship, and homeland duality, they could start basking in their emancipation from the shackles of war, refuge, resettlement, and racialization while planting new roots under the Texas sun. That concludes my presentation. Uh, again, as you can see here on the list, uh, there are some um, other uh, readings, some books and articles about Planet Forward as well, if you wish to read them. I highly recommend uh, Donna Gabaccio's We Are What We Eat, Ethnic Food and Make Americans, as well as the other books. And all these articles are wonderful to read as well. So please do, if you have the time, uh, read uh, these articles about Planet Ford and the Congolese refugees and what they contribute. Okay. So please uh, support uh, Planet Ford Farms. Um, you can purchase merchandise or uh, produce uh, as well as uh, donate or volunteer uh, to be board member, for instance. Okay. They, we need more board members. Uh, so uh, if uh, you have the heart uh, and uh, you have the time, uh, and uh, the energy uh, to volunteer and support Planet Forward, Planet Forward Farms, please do so. Um, we need more volunteers. 
Uh, and in addition, um, again, as I mentioned uh, at the beginning of the presentation in Dallas, there's a great nonprofit organization called Bonton Farms. So if you're interested in supporting them, please, by all means, support Bonton Farms as well to do a lot for the community in South Dallas. And they're expanding uh, in, the metro, uh, in the Metroplex as well. I believe the Lake Highlands region is where they're trying to expand. Uh, and it's all community, right? It's all about connecting with each other and creating a beautiful community of not only uh, fresh produce, but also a beautiful community of people uh, who uh, congregate together uh, to enjoy fresh organic produce and help each other out. All right, so that concludes my presentation. And again, unfortunately, we don't have time uh, to show these videos. And again, we have some technical issues, uh, but I will provide the video links uh, in the chat room. So then that way uh, you can have access to those video links. Thank you. Perfect. And Dr. Vu, we have a couple questions that have come in. First, um, Brandon Morton has asked that you comment okay. more about your background in history oh, cool. and sustainability. Um, he said he thinks many people might think okay. you have to study agriculture to become an expert on the topic. So can you elaborate on that? <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm, again, as I said, began the presentation, I'm no expert on uh, African history or about uh, farming or even gardening. Uh, I'm more interested in recording stories. Uh, as a historian, I, I think it's important to um, interview as many people as possible. So in other words, oral history uh, plays a big role in my field of study. And I think it's important to particularly record stories from so-called invisible communities, right? Like the Congolese uh, diaspora, uh, where historians uh, may not uh, um, um, communicate or may not uh, see Congolese refugees or may, uh, and think that uh, there are no Congress refugees in Houston. But in reality, Congress refugees uh, uh, do live um, in Houston and they are contributing to uh, the local economy as well as uh, providing more green spaces in urban areas that uh, are bereft of such green spaces. And so Congress refugees play an important role in not only building the city's economy, but also diversifying the city's population as well as cuisine. Is that, I hope that answers the question. But yeah, as far as my background, again, my background is on US history, more specifically the Vietnam War uh, and the Vietnamese diaspora. Uh, this is something that I just happened to fall into and became very, very fascinated and interested uh, about Congolese refugees as well as Syrian refugees uh, in Houston as well. Um, there's so many stories to record and there's so many stories to tr try to capture. Um, and, and for Vietnamese refugees, uh, for instance, I mean, there are some people who still don't know much about Vietnamese refugees, uh, particularly in Houston. So it's very personal to me uh, to record their stories and particularly their farming, gardening uh, uh, ways um, as they seek their own emancipatory food ways. And so for the Congolese refugees, there's even less knowledge, right, about the Congolese diaspora in Houston. So it's important to get their stories out. Awesome. Thank you Thank so you much. And then we have another question. Um, or Amy has asked, are there any special permits required to produce slash grow food on this scale in Houston? Could anyone begin to uh, garden or farm? Well, they would, uh, as far as colleagues, uh, refugees, they would, they would uh, work with Planet Ford Farms. Planet Ford Farms would be um, um, the organization, the nonprofit organization that uh, would try to uh, purchase land or acquire land. Uh, the city of Houston, so uh, they would they would make uh, attempts to donate purchase them, but also uh, oftentimes uh, you have, for instance, um, uh, a church may donate some uh, plot of land uh, for Planet Ford uh, to utilize and and uh, farm and uh, and provide farming demonstrations and uh, help train colleagues refugees uh, to get acquainted with the Texas soil and what you can grow here uh, in Texas, and uh, and then. Uh, give the, the, the land over to the Congolese farmers. And so it's uh, it, it's a lot of paperwork. Yeah, it's, uh, it's uh, you would have to ask Liz Ballet, the president of uh, Planet Ford, uh, about just the uh, amount of paperwork that we have to uh, go through uh, to ensure that uh, the land they utilize uh, could be uh, used uh, for farming and could be uh, uh, given over to Congolese refugees to farm. So I can't, I can't answer that question because I don't know all the paperwork um, that Plant Forward has to do uh, to uh, purchase the land or to have the land donated to them and therefore utilize land. Perfect. And then Chancellor has asked, what are your suggestions for city planners? Oh, uh, Sorry. 
Uh, Chancellor has asked, what are your suggestions for city planners to start implementing urban farming? If you are familiar with zoning and community engagement, what action items do you suggest for those parts of planning? Wow, that's an excellent question. And thank you, Chancellor May, for uh, attending this presentation. I appreciate your time and interest. Well, it has to start off uh, as most movements uh, at the grassroots level, right? So as far as, say, um, as a college professor and uh, along with my fellow faculty and, and administrative leaders and professional sports staff, and along with our students, right, uh, we have to, of course, uh, make uh, these issues uh, more um, more uh, noticeable, right? Um, and so in Dallas, we have to raise these issues and educate ourselves as well as others about these issues in hopes of getting the attention of, uh, say, for instance, the Dallas City Council members uh, to support uh, such farming initiatives like Bantan Farms, right? So it's, 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 it's a long, arduous process, but typically we we'll start at the grassroots level. Um, and uh, it, it has to go from uh, the bottom up, right, uh, to gain uh, the attention of our city leaders and, um, and to, to have them uh, understand the importance of green spaces, particularly farming spaces in working class neighborhoods, right? So that way they can avert issues like food insecurity, and that way they can have uh, great access to healthy food options, which overall improve the community, improve uh, the, uh, the population's health, uh, and uh, therefore improve uh, city living, right? And so it's uh, imperative that we all try to educate ourselves and our city leaders um, about these important issues. Any other questions? Well, if there are no further questions, again, please um, support Bonton Farms, support Planet Ford Farms, uh, be advocates for them. We need more green spaces, particularly in urban areas, particularly in working class neighborhoods. Reach out to them. And, uh, and I myself included uh, uh, need to continue to research and knowing about this topic, but also uh, find ways to help such nonprofit organizations. And um, that way I could um, uh, help uh, educate my fellow students and colleagues. And that way these issues uh, would become more prominent, right? Uh, in, uh, in the public uh, in, in the public's eyes and therefore we gain more, more public attention. And uh, hopefully we could, um, change uh, some of our city leaders' minds, uh, or at least uh, persuade uh, our city leaders to uh, concentrate on these important issues related to sustainable urban farms. Awesome, thank you so much, Dr. Vu, for on this topic um, and for just enlightening us okay. on the Planet Forward movement and the Congolese refugees in Houston and sustainable urban farming.